Hello, this is Sid Salmon, and today I'll be reading George Saunders' advice to graduates. This is as it appears in the sixth floor, the New York Times Magazine. The introduction is written by Joel Lovell, and this article first appeared on July 31st, 2013. It's long past graduation season, but we recently learned that George Saunders delivered the convocation speech at Syracuse University for the class of 2013, and George was kind enough to send it our way and allow us to reprint it in the Times. The speech touches on some of the moments in his life and larger themes in both his life and work that George spoke about in the profile that ran in January 2013 in the New York Times. The need for kindness in all things working against our actually achieving it. The risk in focusing too much on success. The trouble with swimming in a river full of monkey feces. The entire speech, graduation season or not, is well worth listening to, and of course looking up online in reading at the New York Times dot com. Here we go. Down through the ages. The traditional form has evolved for this type of speech, which is some old fart, his best years behind him, who, over the course of his life, has made a series of dreadful mistakes. That would be me. Gives heartfelt advice to a group of shining, energetic young people with all of their best years ahead of them. That would be you. And I intend to respect that tradition. Now, one useful thing you can do with an old person, in addition to borrowing money from them, or asking them to do one of their old-time dances so you can watch while laughing is ask. Looking back, what do you regret? And they'll tell you. Sometimes, as you know, they'll tell you, even if you haven't asked. Sometimes, even when you've specifically requested they not tell you, they'll tell you. So, what do I regret? Being poor from time to time? Not really. Working terrible jobs? Like knuckle puller in a slaughterhouse? And don't even ask what that entails. No, I don't regret that. Skinny dipping in a river in Sumatra? A little buzzed. And looking up and seeing like 300 monkeys sitting on a pipeline, pooping down into the river the river in which I was swimming, with my mouth open, naked, of course, and getting deathly ill afterwards and staying sick for the next seven months. Not so much. Do I regret the occasional humiliation? Like once, playing hockey in front of a big crowd, including this girl. Of course, I really liked her. I somehow managed while falling and emitting this weird whooping noise to score on my own goalie while also sending my stick flying into the crowd and nearly hitting that girl. No, I don't even regret that. But here's something I do regret. In seventh grade, this new kid joined our class. In the interest of confidentiality, her convocation speech name will be Ellen. Ellen was small shy. She wore these blue cat's eye glasses that at the time only old ladies wore. When nervous, which was pretty much always, she had a habit of taking a strand of hair into her mouth and chewing on it. So she came to our school and our neighborhood and was mostly ignored, occasionally teased. Her hair tastes good? You know, that sort of thing. I could see that this hurt her. I still remember the way she'd look after such an insult. Eyes cast down, a little gut kicked, as if, having just been reminded of her place in things, she was trying as much as possible to disappear. After a while, she'd drift away, 
hair strands still in her mouth. At home, I imagined after school her mother would say, you know, how's your day, sweetie? And she'd say, oh, fine. And her mother would say, making any friends? And she'd go, sure, lots. Sometimes I'd see her hanging around alone in front of her yard, as if afraid to leave it. And then they moved. That was it. No tragedy. No big final hazing. One day she was there. Next day she wasn't. End of story. Now, why do I regret that? Why, 42 years later, am I still thinking about it? Relative to most of the other kids, I was actually pretty nice to her. I never said an unkind word to her. In fact, I sometimes even mildly defended her. But still, it bothers me. So here's something I know to be true. Although it's a little corny, and I don't quite know what to do with it, what I regret most in my life are failures of kindness. Those moments when another human being was there, in front of me, suffering, and I responded sensibly, reserved, mildly. Or to look at it from the other end of the telescope, who in your life do you remember most fondly, with the most undeniable feelings of warmth? Those were who were kindest to you. That's what I bet. It's a little facile, maybe, and certainly hard to implement. But I'd say, as a goal in life, you could do worse than this. Try to be kinder. Now the million dollar question, what's our problem? Why aren't we kinder? Here's what I think. Each of us is born with a series of built-in confusions that are probably somewhat, somehow, Darwinian. These are, one, we're central to the universe. That is, our personal story is the main and most interesting story, the only story really, Two, we're separate from the universe. There's the U.S. and then, well, out there, all that other junk. Dogs and swing sets and the state of Nebraska and low-hanging clouds and, you know, other people. And three, we're permanent. Death is real. Okay, sure, for you, but not for me. Now, we don't really believe these things. Intellectually, we know better. We believe them viscerally and live by them. And they cause us to prioritize our own needs over the needs of others. Even though what we really want in our hearts is to be less selfish, more aware of what's actually happening in the present moment, more open and more loving. So the million dollar question, how might we do this? How might we become more loving, more open, less selfish, more present, less delusional, etc., etc.? Well, yes, good question. Unfortunately, I only have three minutes left. So let me say this, there are ways you already know that because in your life there have been high kindness periods and low kindness periods and you know what inclined you toward the former and away from the latter. Education is good. Immersing ourselves in a work of art, good. Prayer is good. Meditation is good. A frank talk with a dear friend. Establishing ourselves in some kind of spiritual tradition, recognizing that there have been countless really smart people before us who have asked these same questions and left behind answers for us. Because kindness 
it turns out, is hard. It starts out all, well, rainbows and puppy dogs and expands to include, well, everything. One thing in our favor, some of this becoming kinder happens naturally with age. It might be a simple matter of attrition. As we get older, we come to see how useless it is to be selfish. How illogical, really. We come to love other people and are thereby counter-instructed in our own centrality. We get our butts kicked by real life and people come to our defense and help us and we learn that we're not separate and don't want to be. We see people near and dear to us dropping away and are gradually convinced that maybe we too will drop away someday, a long time from now. Most people, as they age, become less selfish and more loving. I think this is true. The great Syracuse poet Hayden Carruth said in a poem written near the end of his life that he was mostly love now. And so, a prediction, and my heartfelt wish for you, as you get older, yourself will diminish and you will grow in love. You will gradually be replaced by love. If you have kids, that will be a huge moment in your process of self-diminishment. You really won't care what happens to you as long as they benefit. That's one reason your parents are so proud and happy today. One of their fondest dreams has come true. You have accomplished something difficult and tangible that has enlarged you as a person and will make your life better from here on in forever. Congratulations, by the way. When young, we're anxious and understandably to find out if we've got what it takes. Can we succeed? Can we build a viable life for ourselves? But you, in particular, you, of this generation, may have noticed a certain cyclical quality to ambition. You do well in high school in hopes of getting into a good college. So you can do well in the good college in the hopes of getting a good job. So you can do well in the good job. So you can... Well, you get it. And this is actually okay. If we're going to become kinder, that process has to include taking ourselves seriously as doers, as accomplishers, as dreamers. We have to do that to be our best selves. Still, accomplishment is unreliable. Succeeding, whatever that might mean to you, is hard. And the need to do so constantly renews itself. Success is like a mountain that keeps growing ahead of you as you hike it. And there's the very real danger that succeeding will take up your whole life all the big questions go untended so quick end of speech advice since according to me your life is going to be a gradual process of becoming kinder and more loving well hurry up speed it along start right now there's a confusion in each of us a sickness really selfishness but there's also a cure. So be good and proactive and even somewhat desperate. Be patient on your own behalf. Seek out the most efficacious anti-selfishness medicines. Do this energetically for the rest of your life. Do all the other things, the ambitious things. Travel, get rich, get famous, innovate, Lead, fall in love, make and lose fortunes, swim naked in the wild jungle rivers, after having tested it first for monkey poop, but as you do, to the extent that you can, air, 
in the direction of kindness. Do those things that incline you toward the big questions and avoid the things that would reduce you and make you trivial. That luminous part of you that exists beyond personality, your soul, if you will, is as bright and shining as any that has ever been, bright as Shakespeare's, bright as Gandhi's, bright as Mother Teresa's. Clear away everything that keeps you separate from the secret luminous place. Believe it exists. Come to know it better. Nurture it. Share its fruits tirelessly. And someday, in 80 years, when you're 100, and I'm 134, and we're both so kind and loving, we're nearly unbearable. Drop me a line. Let me know how your life has been. I hope you will say, it has been so wonderful. Congratulations, class of 2013. I wish you great happiness, all the luck in the world, and a beautiful summer. Thank you. This has been Sid Salmon, reading George Saunders' advice to graduates as it appeared in the New York Times, the Sixth Floor Magazine, on July 31st, 2013. Thank you.